Welcome into another episode of Debate Night, everybody. We are back once again with some fresh topics and some new analysts. Um, got a fun cast today. Should be interesting. Didn't have any disc golf this past weekend, so we've got kind of fresh topics that um, some people from online generated, and I wrote up myself. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get into our analysts today, starting with Brody Smith. Okay. Uh, right arm is gone. <laughs> Amputated. It, it's, it was that bad last after the stream? Woke up, couldn't feel it. Had to get rid of it. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> One arm, shoeless, Joe Jackson. Excellent. So you're going to play with your left now, or are you just done? Yeah, I might Jake Mon it. Okay. Sounds good. My arm is functioning and i threw twice as many putts actually i probably threw eight times as many putts <laughs> uh lactic acid okay okay fair enough um we're also joined today all the way in sweden by michelle yeah midnight again <laughs> <laughs> ready to dominate listen we can't cater to every time zone but maybe we, we may need to have an episode where we give michelle a, a fair shot and and enough sleep uh we also have gary back here again today <laughs> Hey, great to be back. Uh, in a, a preparation for this episode, I took uh, the wise words of Dwight Schrute. Uh, I think to myself, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. So we're ready to roll. Ooh. Wise words, wise words. And then we also have uh, Jack here wearing a terrible hat. Hey, you hate us because you hate us. Um, I'm happy to be Correct. back. Uh, last time I did say that I was a Waco local, which I am, but some of my friends from my old stomping grounds where I grew up in central Pennsylvania reminded me that I need to let everybody know where, where my ro roots really came from. So representing uh, Pennsylvania as well today. Okay. Well, well that's fun a little story better. about the Texas Rangers. I don't know. We're, have, are they bad right now? They won the no. world series last year. Okay. I don't pay attention to baseball, but w the one time I went to a baseball game there, I guess they were terrible. There was no one in the crowd and we didn't have good seats and we could just have a full on conversation with one of the outfield guys. There was just no one there. That's our nation's pastime right there. They, is that normal for all baseball kinds of games? Just like you show up and no uh, one's there. It depends on what bad, game, what bad. team. And if you go to when any Oakland A's game, then yes, that's very <laughs> normal right now, but it, it completely depends on what you're doing and what game if you're you going to. you go to any game on like a Tuesday afternoon also. Yeah. It's a but, long season. Mm -hmm. A lot of Carolina games. Panthers were like selling tickets in the season for like $5. They were trying to, just, to fill the stadium. So, they were a bad yeah, team. Yeah. They were a bad happens, team. Happens all over the place. Um, all right. Well, we got some good topics today. We're going to hop disc right into it. Pro Tour, though. That's Sorry. true. No, you got to pay a you got to pay a pretty penny to get into the Pro Tour. Um, all right, we're going to get into our first topic here. Uh, so the PDGA they launched a new world rankings system this year. After Anthony Barella's dominant start, he is still sitting at 11th place. Does this alone point out a major flaw in these rankings? And does disc golf need any world rankings at all? Since we could just use the Pro Tour points standings as reference. Brody, what do you think? Well, to answer the second question first, I think the world rankings is is better than the Disc Golf Pro Tour as far as to give it a, a full wide spectrum on what we're looking at. Not all the players are coming over and playing all the events. And it also it does give you an idea of how a player has been the last several years and not just right in this season. With looking at that, though, Anthony Barella was ranked 12th last year and is ranked 11th. After the hot start that he's had, that seemed kind of odd to me. So I went into looking at it a little further. He's not beating Calvin Eagle, Gannon, Ricky, Kyle, Isaac, Paul, Matteo, Simon, Nicholas. So there's no names that he's like behind that you're like, why the heck is that guy in the top 10? Um, but I looked into how the rankings work. Mm -hmm. So these were actually uh, a new calculation system devised by the PGA team, which I was scared because what the heck does that mean? But then it said in collaboration with Mark Brody, and Dylan Bierne of Sport Edge. And Sport Edge actually works with the PJ Tour. Uh, and Brody was actually a developer of the current formula of the official golf world ranking. So I think they know what they're doing. Two years worth is basically what they're going. So if you go back and look, AB's last year, he had a 39th, a 44th, a 75th, a 64th, a 70th, and a 50th. 
Two years ago, he had a 29th, a 32nd, a 100th, a 48th, and a 28th, and a 30th. If you look at Nicholas, who he's beating by one, or Nicholas is one spot ahead of him. Nicholas last year only had a 30th and a 78th finish. And then two years ago had a 64th. So those were those finishes outside the top 25. So it makes sense to me. Okay, fair enough. Brody is on board with the ranking system. Uh, Michelle, what do you think? Yeah, I am too. Because like, if we just used the Pro Tour standings, you could be ranked like number one in the world after one competition or like four. That doesn't make any sense. So we should be going with the world rankings. And to be ranked in the number ranked as number one in the world, you have to stay consistent. You have to be great over a longer time period of time. And that's why I think the world rankings are correct. I agree with Brody. Uh, I don't think that it's flawed. I don't think that it's the same thing. Uh, I definitely believe that we need both. Uh, and the most important part to point out is that the Pro Tour points standings is this season. It's a summary of how you played uh, this season so far. Uh, and it's not a world ranking, and I don't think that it should be calculated to that either. Um, the world ranking is, as Brody says, uh, based off of the last two years, and it should be that. I mean, AB has played great in the last four competition, but not to that extent that you should call him number one in the world right now. Um, not yet, at least. Uh, that could be a whole different answer in a month or two. And I also think that uh, if you look at the FPO, they're more like world rankings and the Pro Tour point standings, but that only shows how the FPO is more even and how it isn't hard being in the top, considering the top is always like the same five, seven women. Um, so yeah. I think that we should have a little more faith in Mark Brody, uh, who's helping creating the world rankings. Okay, fair enough. I mean, it is a brand new system. Um, so that, that is a fair point. And okay, so Michelle and Brody seem to have their idea of the world rankings and their difference between the standings. Gary, what do you think? Well, I think those are great points by Brody and Michelle. Is Anthony at 11th a major flaw? I think it depends on what the PDGA is trying to accomplish with these world rankings. Listen, human humans, we love tier lists. We love top 10s. We also love recency. Uh, the problem is that the system that Mark Brody created is more of a macroscopic view of the league as opposed to a microscopic view. That's why it goes back 104 weeks, like Brody said. I mean, you can see that. Let's do a little experiment here. Let's take Simon Lazat. Go back to April 2022 through June 2022, and let's look at his finishes. He got sixth at Jonesboro, second at DDO, first at OTB, first at Portland, and third at the Preserve. If you zoom into just this patch, you're going to say to yourself, this guy might be the best player in the world, maybe even the top three. But if you zoom out a little bit and look at 2022, you're going to go, okay, a little streaky at points, but definitely a top 10 player. You zoom out to 104 weeks, and those finishes that I mentioned, they're just about to fall off that two-year mark, and you're going to see him slide down the world ranking. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to improve. Using the Pro Tour points on the other side uh, has the opposite problem. It's just way too recent because that list puts Luke Humphreys as the fifth best in the world, if you go off of that, and it puts Calvin at the 12th best, and no offense to Luke Humphreys, but we know how that should not be that way. Um, if you understand how it's built, the system they have makes sense. If you only want a snapshot, go look at some other ranking. My suggestion is the PDGA should trial their system also at 52 weeks and at 78 weeks, and then maybe run the numbers going back 10 years and publish them to see how accurate it is. But I like the system. Yeah, I think probably the biggest point of contention is just how long should we go back? Uh, Jack, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm going in a way different direction than it seems like everybody else has. Um, we've known for a while that most world rankings that we've had in disc golf have flaws, like uh, the U-Disc one I think is the one that gets talked about the most, where uh, players that haven't even played have been retired for you know almost a decade are still on there somehow. Um, and these systems encourage players to sit out of events and not play to maintain their spot. No one's actually done that, but in theory, that's how it works. Uh, the biggest flaw that we see is that most want these to be power rankings, judging and calculating based on the most recent events and weighing that heavier than anything else, giving recency bias 90% of why players rank where they are. On the flip side, the current PGA World Rankings value what's happened most recently at 10% and value the entire history of the player dating back two years more heavily. But we need to have an accurate world rankings is something that includes both. For example, Anthony Barella should be higher than 11th, but if we put him at one because of what he's done most recently, falling tour points only, then that would also put Drew Gibson at 95. I don't think that's right and accurate either. We need a system that values what you've done in the past equally with what you're currently doing. A player like AB shouldn't be held back because of his, because of his first year. This is the first year he's won anything on tour, while a player like Drew Gibson shouldn't be near 100 just because he's had a bad start. 
I think the only question that when it comes to if we need world rankings or if there are bonuses or awards tied to them, I remember when Paul dropped below Ricky in the world rankings a few years ago and was no longer number one for the first time in almost a decade. He didn't seem to care and said being world number one never helped me win a tournament, quote. So if there are no bonuses or awards tied to it, then I don't see why we need them at all. I mean, easy to say when you're no longer world number one. But in fairness, the you're right. It's been weird the last few years because we – haven't really agreed on a set world ranking system. So you almost don't hear people refer to world number one anymore, like it used to when it was just that PDGA system. And even for a while, we had all kind of settled it on the UDISC one, but now the PDGA has theirs and it's a little fuzzy. So I feel like nobody really talks about the world rankings as much anymore. Um, Cause you can get just, such a weird scrambling of players. What do you have to do to get official in front of your world rankings? Can we just come out with the official? I think PDGA says official, I believe. I think there's the I think there says the official yeah. world rankings. Yeah. Okay. Well, they, yeah, I mean, can we I say mean, the actual official world rank? Can, well, we <laughs> on Grip Locked a while back, we talked about doing the universe rankings or something yeah. like that. The so, official universe rank. There's always one trying to trump another. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I think that, um, it's just interesting because disc golf is such a sport of streaky athletes that fall off and and then come back. And there's these injuries lately that sometimes the world rankings can just look a little bit weird to look at. But ultimately, um, yeah, tough to say. Everybody's going to have their opinions. They're going to be a little bit subjective. So, um, yeah, we're going to move on to the next topic here. Um, so recently had an A tier uh, that a lot of pros attended. Um, we saw some of the top players on tour, such as Kristen Tatar and Nicholas Antla, attend this A-tier event, the Persimmon Ridge Retreat. My question is, why are players going to these events, and should the pro tour and player sponsors be upset that players are participating in events that take place out of the spotlight and risking potential injury? Michelle, what do you think? Okay, I do not think that it's a problem that players attend A-tiers outside of pro tour. I think it's way worse when pros, like, on a normal weekday do and go play paddle or any other type of sports or physical movement that has a higher risk for injury. I don't think that injury risk is higher just because they play in a tournament. Like seriously, they do that every single week. Uh, it's not a crazy movement for their body. And I think for Kristen to play this event is rather positive than negative. I think that uh, the competition was low. The only real competition was own. Uh, and for Kristen to win this event means that she has a win in her back going into Jonesboro, and that will give her a boost of confidence. And honestly, I should think she will win Jonesboro too this year. Last year, she didn't win Jonesboro. Uh, and I think that this slow start from Kristen really made her go into that tournament and in Persimmon Ridge just to boost the confidence, get a no pressure on her back competition. And also, I think there are so many players now, and uh, I playing these A tiers is another way to cash some more money. I also saw that I was a lot of European players on the MPO side, and it is expensive to go over there and travel and do it, competitions over there. So I don't see a problem uh, about that. And I also don't see a problem for sponsors because they get more exposure from their players. Yeah, I, I do think it's very valid, the idea that players can use it as sort of a uh, a speed bump, like they or a speed boost, I should say. They can um, be in a slow part of the season, pick up a little momentum, because you're right, Kristen beating own, that will give her a little bit of momentum and a little bit of a, a mental boost since she's it's been a while since she's been uh, in the winner's circle or a while by her standard. So I do definitely <laughs> agree with that point. Um, Gary, what are your thoughts? First of all, big congrats to uh, Kristen Tatar and Jeremy Coling for taking that one down. I think there's some seriously obvious reasons why why players play these events. They enjoy the courses. Maybe they enjoy the area. They're attached to the area somehow, or they're just addicted to the competition of disc golf. But there's really two big reasons in my mind why most of the players are playing these events. First of all, you've got your mid-level pros who are trying to grind on tour, get that money. Like Michelle said, it's important to keep them on, on the tour. And then you've got the others who are working on their game or they're trying to jumpstart their season, or maybe they're trying to get out of a slump, like, like everyone here has mentioned already. And Kristen may have done that just to shake some things loose. And um, I think we're going to see that translate really well for her at Jonesboro. I'm not sure why Nicholas was there. Maybe it's because he was traveling with the, the uh, all the Finns. Uh, I'm going to pronounce these wrong, but uh, Niemannen, Heitinen, and Makala, they, you know, they were all there, so maybe he was traveling with them. But it didn't really work out too well for him because he couldn't win over this weaker field. Um, and also, same goes for Adam Hammes and Kevin Jones, who couldn't even crack the top 20 in this much weaker field. 
Um, personally, if I'm the sponsors, I might be a bit concerned over some participation. You know, Owen has the lingering elbow issues. Kristen's talked about being too busy and stressed out. But, you know, I, I think the pros are going to make the decisions they're going to make. But maybe we see the sponsors restructure contracts in the future. But I think exposure is a good reason to play as well. If I'm the pro tour, though, I don't mind players going to these events because it serves as a free test of a venue and courses. If play, players like the course and uh, spectators like the course, it's a place for them to maybe go in the future. And Persimmon Ridge look great. It also engages more audiences in disc golf. And that's just good for the whole sport. Yeah, good point on the uh, on testing venues. That is an interesting way to look at it. And like you mentioned, flip side to the coin of gaining some positive momentum, you can certainly gain some negative momentum. If you think you're going to play a weaker field, you play that weaker field and then play very bad and don't even come close to winning. Um, Jack, what do you think about it? Yeah, should the Pro Tour be upset? Maybe. I don't think so, but maybe. I think we can all agree that if Kristen went down with an injury at Persimmon Ridge that knocked her out for the rest of the year, FPO viewership would take a hit. But if we're following this same logic, then players shouldn't be allowed to practice either. Like, sure, Paige Pierce would, uh, would have played much more of the season last year if she didn't break her ankle before European Open. But that doesn't mean that players shouldn't be allowed to play outside of their tournament rounds, which would be what this is implying. The reason that players in the NBA on contracts aren't allowed to go play pickup during the season at a local gym is because of what playing a physical sport with other people could do to them, not because of what they might do to themselves. If that was the case, practice and shoot arounds wouldn't happen in the NBA either until the DGPT tour card contract retires, requires you to not play events outside of DGPT events and majors, then, this, then there isn't an issue. If the DGPT made that part of getting a tour card, then we would see some major boycotts and potentially another tour come up to surpass them. A rule like that also isn't fair to players who aren't getting as much on tour and are trying to make ends meet to keep this going. It wouldn't be fair that because Nick Loss is the darling of the DGPT, a guy like Paul Kranz isn't allowed to play that event to make ends meet. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely some, uh, there's definitely a lot of pay disparity in the, on the pro tour right now. And, and you make a good point. Um, there's a big difference between a pickup basketball game or get, you know, go even further into it, playing football or hockey and golf. You know, it is a lot different. Um, Brody. Yeah. I'm going to give Jack a compliment. Cause I think he made the best point so far. Uh, you know, players, if they're not playing at a tournament, they're going to be practicing anyways. And some would say you actually probably are going to be throwing more shots and putting more strain on your body in practice than you would maybe in a tournament week. Uh, but I will say this, Jack, just, just for the commenters out there, next question, don't read off a script. Let's freaking go off the dome here. Let's go off the dome. But um, I'll say this. I think a couple things. First one, I think a lot of it has to do with the course because the Las Vegas challenge isn't on tour anymore. And I'm kind of questioning, hey, I'm going to probably be out there at the same time, potentially when the tournament happens. Do I want to play in it? Maybe. Uh, but really, I think this actually comes down to money. Um, if we're speculating, because obviously we didn't reach out to these players to ask them why they're playing. If we're speculating, I think it comes down to money. You obviously have, we're talking about top players here. So we're not talking about the people that have to play to keep, you know, pay the bills, get the gas money. We're talking about Nicholas. We're talking about Kristen who have good contracts. I think if they had more money, they're either flying back and spending time with their family, hanging out at their house or they're doing other stuff. They're not going and playing tournament. I think right now where the sport is, the money isn't up there to where people are doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, there's a lot of factors to consider. And if Chris was making $5 million a year, I would be shocked her playing in these tournaments. Chris is making a lot of money, but I also think a, not making a five lot of million. times, no, a lot of times they're just out That's there too on tour. And it's like, if there's a free paycheck, there's a free paycheck. You know, it's tough. If you're Kristen Tatar and you're going to be playing disc golf anyways, how are you going to turn down a few thousand dollars potentially at an A tier? Hey, Trevor, I'll give you, I'll give you five dollars to putt for an hour straight. Free paycheck. Five. You just have to putt. So that is your point. My my point is, it's a free paycheck only makes sense when you're at a certain point. Two thousand dollars. 3,000, what was the winner? How much did the winner make? 3,000? Probably a few grand. I don't think someone's doing that if they're making 5 million a year and they have other stuff going on. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm what, going based what I'm off saying. of what she's making now. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. Obviously, yes, if they're making more than it wouldn't. Jack, did you have something to add? Yeah, I've got a rebuttal to Brody. Brody, I know you, you Are you reading this off the script score. or is this off your dome? 
Well, I know Go you ahead, struggle Jack. to see the score, but if I've got a script and I'm beating you nine to seven right now, then I'm going to do it every time. So I know you struggle to see. Hey, I'm just trying at, to give but... you. I'm just trying to give. I'm give, trying to give the listeners and the viewers at home what they want. <laughs> and I'm telling you, they do not like it when people just read off a script. That's all I'm trying to say, brother. I've got I'm trying, notes. I'm trying to help I've got you notes out, and I use them. I'm to help yeah, you out. I mean. I can't, I don't know what the comments always say about it, but like, I can't really sympathize that much when like, I mean, I don't know. Like if the point is made, the point is made. It's Do one whatever thing. you want. Do whatever Listen, you want. It's, it's one thing if, if somebody can't read emphatically when reading off the script and they're like, I think that the best reason, but that's not what's happening here. You know, I mean, <laughs> you're over saying, there in your corner. I'm just saying tur ground turkey probably. Well, yeah, because I'm grinding, but I'm just is saying. Is it ground turkey? Yeah, it's delicious. Kelsey's an <laughs> excellent, excellent chef. All I'm just trying to say is there's a difference between debate night and writing a blog. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay. okay. Jack O I, sounds like he would be writing a really good blog right now. and I would read it. A darn good one. I appreciate I listen, it, really. I'll leave it to the comments to decide how they feel about that. I, I'm going to stay out of it. I'm going to stay out of it. I can only hear what I can hear. I'm just hear. trying to help. Man of the people. All right. <laughs> He's a man of the people. Uh, we're going to move on to our next topic here. Um, this sudden. one was submitted. <laughs> this was submitted a lot of times uh, through our um, topic submission link. So I kind of wrote a generic or broad question surrounding it. A lot of people want to talk about OB rules. So a little bit of a hypothetical. Let's say the Pro Tour <laughs> has put you in charge of all OB rules going forward. You have full control over how out of bounds is officiated and marked. What changes would you implement or would you not change anything and why in that case? Gary, what are you doing? I, I'm honored that the Pro Tour recognizes my expertise because I'm out of bounds more often than I'd like to be, so I could make changes here. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make a lot of drastic changes because, let's be honest, the Pro Tour has seen plenty of changes. They don't need too many more from me right now. But anything that would happen would probably be like at an iceberg pace, slow and deliberate and thought out. The first thing I'd probably do is I'd spend time thinking about what the purpose of out of bounds really even is. You know, it's there to protect spectators, protect other players, um, also to help create some separation for better or worse. Sometimes it encourages risk reward behavior, which is great to see players have to determine what their shot's going to be like. Um, and it protects the integrity of the course design, which I think is a, a valuable thing to see courses played, not necessarily always as they're intended, but for the most part, as they're intended things that OB shouldn't be doing, you know, it shouldn't be, um, the only measure for creating difficulty on a course, it shouldn't bail out players from making poor shots. And it shouldn't be difficult to understand. I think the second step I would take is I talked to other pros. I talked to course designers and we'd come to the consensus of what's working and what's not working right now. Um, I would lean a little bit on my own bias. I like natural OB. I think it promotes creativity and shot shaping. I think it creates less confusion about where lies are at. And it, it remains punishing for those who land there. The next step would be um, I would make markings clear and easy to see for both players and um, spectators. Next step would be to make sure that no changes happen during the practice period before tournaments for players. It stays consistent. And then last but not least, I'd make sure that spotters were in the right place, uh, especially where it's difficult to determine what out of bounds is and equip them with the knowledge to know where to mark things. That's a, yeah, that's a key one there. Um, yeah, confetti for sure there, Brody. Uh, all right, Gary's got a lot of good ideas. Jack, what are your plans? All right, well, for starters, uh, I'm going to say let's eliminate the bunker rule entirely. I think it's dumb, and this may be a hot take, but think about the rules of disc golf. If you take a practice throw during a tournament, you are assessed that throw counts and a penalty stroke, and then you have to throw again if you're calling it a practice throw. So if we're doing the whole bunker thing, then basically you're getting free practice throws if you look at it like that. Um, doesn't make sense. I would encourage hazard to be used more frequently. However, making a hole that you can be within 20 feet of the basket and take a penalty stroke is dumb. Uh, I'm actually all for circle one having trees and stuff in it that makes it tougher. But to take a piece of the circle and say, yeah, that's not okay is dumb. I think we see this most often on golf course, uh, disc golf course hybrids. If you don't want people getting in the sand trap or um, if the property doesn't want people going in the sand trap, then don't make it so it's hazard. So you're not allowed in there. But then once you go in there, okay, well, now you can go in and play from there and assess a penalty stroke. No, make it normal stroke and distance and pull it all the way back. Um, also, all OB should be uh, with string, not with paint. Um, it doesn't make sense that because of the way a blade of grass is sticking up when the paint lines come in, it could have changed the way that the OB line is is made um and lastly i'm so done with the benefits of the player when a disc is ob thing 
Um, if there's a question as to whether or not a disc is in bounds without conclusive evidence, then call it out of bounds. You can't tell me that a player was trying to play it that close to the OB that it brings it into question, and it would be robbing them of a perfectly executed shot. Call it OB and move on. Okay. Jack's got, Jack's got some hot takes, Brody. Oh, we need so much more time for this question because there's there's a lot of good points. You guys actually both made some decent points that I agree with, but you also made a lot of points that I think are are really dumb. Um, the <laughs> first first thing is the first thing that we need to do is literally just a color system. White stakes is OB stroke and distance. You go in a white stake area, you have to rethrow at a stroke. Then you have yellow stakes. That is our hazard rule. You go into a yellow area, you add a stroke, you throw from where your disc is. Red stakes, that's where if your disc crosses, you go with your your disc was last inbounds. Uh, you can advance to where your disc was last inbounds, stroke penalty. If we did that, it would remove the fact of all these different holes that we're wondering, how do we play this? What is this happening? Commentators have no idea what's going on. Spectators have no idea that's going on. Um, now I have a lot of rebuttals. I have a lot of rebuttals, so I'm going to use it now, but we might have more time afterwards. First one, Gary, natural OB. What, what does that mean? You know, when you're in the woods, you've got plenty of space off to the side, the left or the right. You know, you've got wooded space there. There's no need to make artifact, you know, OB lines where they're already being punished for being in the woods. Okay, so if I'm in the woods and I build a lake, is that now natural OB? Well, I think when it comes to that, you're you're talking about creating a situation where you're spending way too much time with a lake there. You, you, there's good uses of OB to protect certain parts of the course and to cut down on time right, loss. We might need more the time on this one, Trevor, because I have one else for Jack. But the last thing I was going to say is OB is not made to protect spectators. I disagree with that heavily with what Gary said. Is that's, That is not the purpose of OB. That should not okay. be a course design. Okay. Um, well, a few things were said there. We'll get the rest of it after this. Uh, Michelle, you, you have your turn now. Yeah. I would like to make some big change to the OB rules. Um, might be a little bit controversial here, but I don't like the fact that you can play with out of bounds and go for some shots and not be afraid because, oh, I'll just cross over there and I have a 20-foot putt for par anyways if I just go a little bit OB. Let's make OB harder and not as forgiving. Let's play OB like golf and re-throw from previous life you go OB. That would easily increase the difficulty without making like big and hard changes, like making the basket smaller, making the chains smaller, anything like that. It would force the players to play more golf and be more tactical. It would also mean that it would be more penalized to go OB than right now. That would make holes more have like more uh, score separation and be more unforgiving. And that would also open up for more hazarding play like holes with OB close to the basket, if you change that to hazard instead over there, uh, you could stand in a hazard with penalty and not have that being able to walk closer to the basket and uh, making that putt easier. Uh, it would make it more challenging and force more out of the players. So I would change the OB rule. <laughs> yeah, listen, I, I'm all for that, except the only issue I think is the pace of play. I think uh, Brody can speak to that. The pace of play would yeah, probably but... change drastic. What, what what did you have, Dad? Then you just throw a provisional. Well, it's more so like if a player right now, if you a player throws, it was, it was you get to at least advance. Uh, you get to continue moving down the fairway. Like yeah. some players, they may never make it up that fairway if they don't get <laughs> bailed out by the OB. <laughs> but Brody, what was your other rebuttal? Well, my I do other... wish it was that hard, though. I do. My other rebuttal is with Jack saying that he doesn't like the idea of like, if you throw inside the circle, you should be fine. He doesn't like OB or hazard 20 feet away. And, and my biggest thing to that is you have to start making disc golf harder to separate great players from good players and good players from bad players. And by doing that, the idea that you can just throw your disc 30 feet in any direction of where the basket is, is not good better players are going to want to have smaller landing zones because they're going to be able to land it in those smaller landing zones more often than bad players. And so if you have this idea of like, yeah, just spray it wherever you want. And then if you make the putt, you get the same score as the person that threw it to the right side of the green. We're not seeing the scoring separation where we should. 
So Brody, I think, I think you misunderstood me because what I, the hole that I was thinking about when I was thinking about this whole hazard within the circle thing is the uh, it was hole seven at LVC, the one that Garrett Gerthy aced. It's a par four, but it's got the two, uh, you know, mm-hmm. like two sand traps, but then also sure. the green. And what I'm saying is instead of making those That's sand a bad hole. hazard where you can land within 15 feet, but instead of having a putt for Eagle, you're putting from the same place and taking a penalty stroke and putting for birdie. If you land there, either it's okay or it's out of bounds. You have to take it all the way to the back of the sand trap because I also agree. I think it's too easy then if it's you're looking at a hole like that. And you're like, well, I can just bail out to being out of bounds but having a putt right here um, to s- save, in that case, birdie or in other case, a par. Yeah, that's that's a bad hole because of the distance, right? We're all throwing very like 400 plus foot shots into that green to be able to try to land in a because that's a 10 foot landing zone is what you're landing in. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the green again. We're pl- that's playing disc golf on a golf course, a course that was designed for golf, and you're trying to figure out a way. And this goes back to my question with Gary: is <laughs> Gary? I think a lot of people that think courses look bad is because. Um, we are not able to actually play on a lot of disc golf courses. There mm-hmm. aren't just a lot of disc golf courses out there. And so this man-made OB, we're having to do that because we are playing on a, a spot that we have to then pick up and be like, disc golf doesn't exist here anymore. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if you're able to make OB long grass and that's artificial, there's no reason that needs, you know, the only real OB, and in this instance, it's like throwing in the water because you can't play it from there. So tall grass shouldn't be technically OB if you want natural uh, OB, but because it's tall, you can see, oh man, he's not supposed to go in there. And so that's, I think that's the big issue with a lot of people is just how courses look. Mm -hmm. Here's my question with the baskets proximity to out of bounds. Do you think there's a line to draw of like for let's, we're talking about out of bounds. So like it could be water or an out of bounds line. How close can the basket get to that? before it's even a little bit too ridiculous can it be well, right up ta- against it are we talking stroke and distance here too or are we because t- i don't like no, i don't like it OB when OB's, rules, i don't like the OB no, as it is see i don't like in that instance i don't like it unless it's in a certain spot because now you can have guys we saw it with simon Lazat on hole 16 back at um um Deaglo, true. where Deaglo, he just true. bombed it and then tapped him par right I, that's stupid that that shot that he threw took zero skill and he was able to just walk away with a par. Now, obviously, yes, it was a smart move on his part. I'm I'm not discrediting him then, but I'm saying when he's in that spot, I think we all want to have to see him execute a good shot and not right. be able to just bomb something out of be like that. So um if it's done in the right way, uh Trevor, like I like OB five feet short of the basket. Short. So mm-hmm. that way, if you don't ever clear, you're, you're boned. And now yeah. you have guys bombing it. Like, I, I think another good hole is hole five at USDGC, for the most part. Um, you still are going to have some people, you know, skip into the water and then have a tap in on the par five. Is that the par five? Did I have that right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that tee shot's tough because the OB is actually at an angle versus if the OB was just flat, where you're throwing it everyone would just chuck it over and then you'd have a tap in par a lot of people don't ever clear because it's at that angle so that's what i'll say on that yeah the ob hasn't been touched a ton in disc golf but i think it is due for an overhaul it it definitely could could use some changes and i think it it could be coming soon enough um all right one more topic here before our finals we're gonna talk a little about a little bit about house of discs um the giant disc golf conglomerate taking over so house of Discs just re-entered the news this time announcing that all the disc mania well i shouldn't really say announcing really it kind of got leaked i think but in any case they announced that all of the disc mania fulfillment will move to emporia a move that will likely cut costs and simplify their business but will shake up the disc golf landscape in Colorado, no doubt as well. What are your thoughts on the house of discs business model in general? Do you think brands benefit by allowing themselves to be bought by this parent brand? Jack, what do you think? Yeah, well, for starters, I'd like to say that when disc mania announced that they were making their own discs, um, I knew that that was full of it. You know, they, their, their C line is just lucid ice. So let's just, let's just get that out of the way. So something like this, a move from them being, you know, another time that they are getting moved to a place they've never been before that just so happens to be where another trilogy company is, is not all that surprising. Um, 
Um, but all that, all that to say that I think House of Discs is doing a really good job when it comes to what they're trying to do. I think they're making very smart and savvy business decisions. Um, when it comes to disc golf, they're doing stuff that is um, has has little. They're putting relatively little skin in the game for a large return when you look at it compared to other investments that we've seen in disc golf, whether how crazy they may have been. Um, and so I think that they're, they're doing a good job. Um, when it comes to, if you're a small company, would you sell? Um, I'm going to say no. Uh, y'all talked about it on, on grip locked yesterday, the, the hometown feel and small business support status that smaller companies have goes out the window when you sell to these, to big companies like this. Like imagine if your local family diner was bought out by Denny's, you'd walk in, you know, thinking like, oh, well, I mean, it's Denny's, but it's the same people. They held the staff over and everything. It's going to be the same. It's not going to be the same corporate hands and corporate money get involved and that changes things. So if I'm a company like mint clash RPM or gateway, I'm not selling. Um, if it comes to it, I'll strike up a deal that you can make my disc for me, but I'm not selling to you. Okay. Not selling, but like the business moves that yeah, they're I, making. Yeah. Brody. Go I was going to say, I respect off the dome there. I respect that. Um, <laughs> I, I, my only notes that I had on this was no idea. I'm going to be honest. I really have no clue about this topic at all. Uh, I'll say this. Nice. It, if you're if you're a business owner, right? You know, I'll put myself in my in the shoes. If someone, if House of Disc came to Foundation right now and was like, "Hey, we love what you're doing. We love what your media is doing. We want to buy you guys out." I don't. I don't think me and Hunter would sell. However, the mom and pop shop that you said and like Denny's is coming in saying, "Hey, we want to buy you out." If they're 70 years old and they've been doing this forever and they don't want to like pass it along through their family, they might be like, yo, this is a nice little retirement. See ya. I'm out of here. So I think it depends on where you're at. I don't really know the owners of any of these companies. I don't really know where they're at mentally or, you know, where they're financially at or what they want to do with it. Um, is it weird that they're moving to Emporia? Like, is this, is this like a known fact now that they don't make their discs? Yeah. Have, they, have they come out and said that themselves? Well, this, uh, well, no, their stance is that they do make their discs via their plant in Sweden that happens to be right next to the Latitude plant. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's just the I fulfillment. Mean, yeah, I, I honestly have really no thoughts on this topic. Other Sound than business that. advice from Brody. Sell yeah, your sorry. days. I mean, there's a, like, to kind of play off of what you did mention, though, there is the you know, the commonality that a lot of these companies that have been bought so far probably do serve uh, or do stand to gain something from their financial situation. You know, it's not necessarily that they're all on top of the world. I mean, I don't think Joe has wanted to get bought out. Here's well, here's yeah, no. And here's the thing in this game of disc golf, sometimes you got to take your paycheck when it comes. And when Jeremy Rusco had his opportunity to take his paycheck, I think he probably took it at a wise time because you may never get it again. Uh, Michelle, what do you think? Yeah, so okay, I did do a little research compared to Brody, <laughs> but nice. I think yeah. that it's zero. money that comes money that comes outside of the sport because they were outside investors going in. I think that is what we need to grow the sport in like every way possible. I think that if more investors put money and belief in disc golf, we would have more sponsors, more price money, more visibility, commercials, you name it, like everything. And I do think that the business model that House of Disc Hughes is good to some extent. I think that it would be problematic if they were to buy up like more brands and monopolize it. Um, competition between companies is what drives the com companies forward. And it's, it's like the biggest point for long-term success in the sport. And I do think that some brands would benefit from being bought, like smaller brands that haven't like won over the market or don't have the resources to do everything themselves. Uh, they would absolutely benefit from it. They would get more advertisement, more visibility. That being said, though, I think that I agree with you guys. Bigger companies would lose if they were bought. Um, but I do think that it would be interesting if there would pop up like other investors in the, and invest in other disc golf brands and make another house of disc and compete with them uh, just to help grow and and push each other forward. Um it could also help like smaller or medium sized brands to grow more and get better players to the teams and grow more in the market. Like all type of outside investors could help. 
Yeah, I think most people can get on board with the fact that there is outside money coming into disc golf through this, and that's exciting. It's just that the idea of the monopoly, I think, can probably scare some people away. So those are good points. Uh, Gary, wrap it up for us. I think it's a really big deal for disc golf in the space and like the future of the growth of the sport, because if venture capitalists are coming in and they're doing this, it's a testament to our recent growth. If I was looking at this through the lens of like the local disc golfer and stuff like that, I could see where the concern could come from. Cause like, you know, disc golf has been a very grassroots thing for a long time. And this can kind of look like big businesses coming in, caring more about money than it is, about the growth of the sport. And yes, moving to Emporia does mean the loss of some jobs, which is never a good thing. But in the end, I think the average disc golfer is not going to care. They're not going to remember half of this. And the only thing they're going to care about is where they can get their plastic and how much it's going to cost them to do it. Um, as a business side of things, I like it a lot because I think when you have a company this large, you know, it gives them stronger negotiation for the cost of their materials because the order quantities are increasing so they can negotiate better, which creates better price markets for the you know people who are buying the discs. A, a unified ordering platform, that's going to be huge for the local retailers to be able to get everything in one place. For me, it's all down to the brain share, right? To have people who are outside of the realm of disc golf to be able to bring in experts in marketing and supply chain management, e-commerce, sales and finance finance is going to make big things happen for these companies and help them cut down on mistakes made by if they'd be on their own. Um, and potentially that's more money in the pockets of the people who they sponsor. I think being bought out by a parent brand like this could be a good thing if you're willing to give up some of your, your roots and it could be make to your, you know, you're part of the future of disc golf. But the biggest question we should ask is what's going on in Emporia? Jeremy Rusco buys the country club, Dismania moves in. What's happening next? Jeremy Rusco land. I, I have up. a quick, quick rebuttal. Sorry, there's a okay. long episode. Quick rebuttal. I, Gary said something. I'm trying to remember. You said something about what were you saying about the growth of the sport? Like trying to grow the sport, but you're saying like they should be focusing more on profits or something. Instead no, of growing, I, I, or, I said that uh, like your local average disc golfer might see this uh, as more of they're caring about getting money than they are the growth of the sport because they see what's right in front of them. They're not seeing the larger picture things like from a business perspective, it's definitely pushing the sport forward, but to a local disc golfer, who's not paying attention to all the podcasts, reading all the posts and stuff like that, they could just see this as a, as a money grab, but to, you know, a venture capitalist that only cares about getting rich. Well, I was going to say like the, yeah, I was going to say, do you guys think that, companies in disc golf right now are doing a good job of trying to get more people into disc golf. Mm, not necessarily manufacturers, no. pro tour, everything. Do you think yeah. companies are doing a good job of trying to get more people into disc golf? One of the or things do you think that's companies are focusing more on their bottom line and just trying to get the, as yeah. much piece of the pie as they can. Totally. How much are the costs of the ticket to an event? Do you think there's I, both, been, Jack? One of the things that's confused I, me well, the so most. So think about it. Go ahead, Jack. So, so think about it. If you are, let's let's take Innova, for example, and let's say that 20%, I know this is, eh, it might not be too high. Let's say 20% of all of the discs that get bought by disc golfers are your disc. Let's just, I'm throwing random numbers out there, but let's just say that. So if, if you know that you're going to have 20%, the more people that you get playing, the higher the total number is, the larger, even if your percentage stays the same, the larger influx of money you're going to get. Now, I don't know how much they're actually doing, but I think that manufacturers are looking and seeing that the more people that come play, the more people there are going to be that are going to buy our product. And that I do think they want to do. Well, that's, that's, incentive. that's what they should do, but is that what they are but doing? That's my question is what yeah. are companies doing? What are companies doing to try to get more people to play disc golf? Michelle, did you have something to add as well? Yeah, if I look at Sweden because or in the Nordic countries, that is what I have to look at. Uh, I don't think that like brands are doing anything. It's private people who is running tournaments, amateur tournaments uh, that are nationally and trying to grow that way. Uh, I have never seen brands do anything. Yeah, what's when that I, tournament? Oh, go, Trevor, sorry. When, I would say when I think of companies that are, or organizations that are growing the sport of disc golf actively, you go to USDGC every year, there's 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 a uh, organization called Edge Disc Golf, and they're bussing kids out yes. to USDGC and showing them disc golf. That's growing disc golf. And mm -hmm. that's what I want to see more companies doing, because it's good PR. 
You know, it's really good. Hey, I'm Discraft or whatever, and I have this annual camp or whatever, or I'm sending vendors to uh, local festivals. I don't know, just like ways to get disc golf in front of people. Because I guess Paul, the way- I guess Paige is at Bonnaroo. Paige does some stuff yeah. at Bonnaroo. There you go. I'm just saying the, the ultimately the way you're going to grow disc golf is getting a disc in somebody's hand and having them throw it a basket. And that's how you're going to like decide if you like the game or not. So yeah, I, I feel like in the last five years or so, I, we we grew a lot just circumstantially with the COVID virus. I'd like to see more companies like take a big emphasis on like, let's just get more people playing the game. Because yeah, if you position yourself in the funnel in a good place as a company, you should want to grow it. Because like Jack mentioned, there's a passive growth that's going to happen with your company if there's more people playing disc golf. Yeah, we, uh, you know, I've gotten those emails where it's like, if you get one percent of your following to sign up to this app, you'll make a hundred thousand. It's like, <laughs> no one, no, I'm not going to get one percent to sign up to the app. Right. But the idea, that idea with disc golf, like our number is not even that high yet. Our number no. is not even high enough right now to where it would actually make a good dent for a company to come in. And that's where like you guys are all saying like outside investors should come in. It's like they probably look at disc golf and be like, that does not look like a good ROI. I'm not really interested in that. And so it's more about the companies that are currently in disc golf that need to be doing more stuff on. My biggest thing is the social media. The majority of companies have terrible social media. And that right now is like, that's, that's how you get kids. That's how Mm -hmm. you get people interested in something new is social media. And we see, very little. I think the disc golf pro tour is doing a good job. Um, they're social, they're pumping out a lot of content, but a lot of these other disc golf companies, I just don't really see that much on social. And it's like, yeah, yeah. that's so kind of what we need to see. Especially for manufacturers. Like I would say the best disc golf social media, like Instagram wise is like groups, like another round, for example, like my mother-in-law, she like knows I play disc golf. That's it. Anytime she randomly sees something about disc golf, it's by another round and she sends it to me. Yeah. Like you see more, they, more they content stuff, out there. Fun stuff. There's a, there's a definitely a heavy burden to grow disc golf. And I think sometimes companies probably look at each other and say, well, you do it. And mm. you know, cause it takes resources. It does, you know, it's not just going to happen. You know, you might have to buy ads. You might have to run camps. It's, you know, it's interesting. Somebody, and that's why specific organizations like an edge or there's others mm. like them uh, are really important. Um, all right. Good talk. We're gonna move on to our finals. We got Gary and Jack. Is this a rematch? Or am I crazy? Gary and Rich. Okay. <laughs> oh, I was Gary and Rich. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, Gary, you are in the lead currently by one point. Would you like to go first or second? I'm going to do the opposite of the last time and go second this time. So, okay. Jack, you got I'll it. Try and close. Um, all right. All we're right. going to do a little goat go talk. talk. This will this will for sure be super rational, and everybody in the comments will totally agree with everything we say because we're talking about the goats. Um, so here's the question: Many would say that Paul Macbeth eclipsed Climo as the greatest of all time, winning less titles but doing it in a tougher era. Would you say we are entering an era different enough from Paul's prime to say the criteria to become the goat from an accomplishment aspect has changed? And if so, what would a player need to win now to pass Paul? Jack, what do you think? Yeah, I think this is such a good question. I, I mean, I think we see this a lot in team sports, this GOAT debate, which makes it hard to compare. Um, but, you know, we're going to try anyways. Um, the latest debate about GOATs that's been a, has been in women's college basketball with Caitlin Clark recently, um, who where it's sort of this, you know, what do you value more? Do you value the championships more? Or do you value the stats more? And I think just where we are in, in disc golf is with um, we're just too young when it comes to championships. You know, the separation between – um, you know, Paul to Climo and from where we are all the way back then is 20 some years where, as opposed to, you know, you look at the NBA, for example, you know, like Michael Jordan was doing what he was doing 25 years ago. And before him, it was Bill Russell. who was, you know, however many years ago, 40 plus. So we're just sort of, we're just really, really young. Um, I also think it's really hard to say that the qualifications have changed when a uh, player's career isn't even over yet. Um, you know, like who knows, Macbeth might win two more world championships. We don't, we don't know. And so then at that point, are we like, okay, well, do we value his, uh, you know, last three more than his first five when we go to compare because the era changed. Um, so I think we're just too early. Uh, we're still in a place where, you know, it's like, man, playing, playing top 20 on the pro tour is really, really tough, which is awesome. You know, early on in Macbeth's career, 
it wasn't like that. It was like, if you're in sixth place, you might be playing 10 30 rated golf, whereas opposed to we could be 10 years away from playing 10 50 or 10 40 rated golf doesn't crack the top 45. And at that point, then less championships, smaller trophy case might look a lot better. And say a guy like Gannon Burr, who ends his career with two USDGCs, three worlds, there might be a case to make that because of, you know, how consistently he was in the top 20, not even the top five, he might be worthy of, of the goat debate. Gosh, man, if, if, uh, if 1045, 1050 golf doesn't get you in the top 45 in a few years, we're going to be watching something crazy. That's what I'll say about that. Um, all right, Gary, what are your thoughts on this goat conversation? I think this kind of goes back to our first question. You know how we talked to how people like to debate the the rankings, the top tens, the tier list. People love the goat conversation. They love to hate the goat conversation. Um, when you think about what it means to be the goat of anything, it just it goes so far beyond just the wins. It's uh, what did you do to inspire the next generation of players? How did you leave your mark on the sport? Did you move the game forward in any meaningful way? Were you dominant? Um, an unwavering ferocity on and off the course. I mean, I have no disrespect to Ken Climo because he was incredible. And I love listening to him talk about his time. Um, but for me, he's become the Bill Russell of disc golf. When you look back at what Paul has accomplished in the game and outside of it, he's he's the GOAT. The question is, like you said, has the game and its requirements changed enough? Personally, I don't think the game has quite yet had the requirements change. Um, I think we're getting close. You know, chase cards... They're, they're getting winners on them. Final rounds have more than just two people in contention. Players are coming into the sport with all the tools already. Um, the competition is fiercer than it's ever been before. But I think if you plucked out a 2015 Paul Macbeth, I think he'd still be on top of the field a lot of weeks. Would he win 19 to 25 in a grand slam? I don't, maybe not, but he'd still be very, very dominant. Um, the change of what it means to be a goat between Ken Climo's era and Paul Macbeth's era was vast. And like Jack said, it's not been long enough yet. Um, I think you still need four to five world championships. You still need seven or eight other majors. I think you need to show an unwavering desire for excellence you know, everywhere you go. I think you have to give back to the sport. Look at what the Paul Macbeth Foundation has been able to do. He's changing the history of what's gone on in disc golf. He's writing a new chapter in the page of the sport. And listen, I'm not a diehard Macbeth fan by any means, but it's hard to see how we could accept anything less than what he's put down for a brand new goat to be crowned anytime soon. Personally, I'm just happy I discovered the sport when I did because I got to see it in action. Yeah, um, I think that um, when you talk about the goat conversation, I think that another interesting thing with Paul is he has still won recently enough that he can kind of stamp his impact or his his game on this generation's field i think that's a really big thing like if paul were to go a lot more years and not win and like that there's like that gap between when his success was and what is currently happening that is when you start to be like well were they that good or was the field weaker uh, i think that's what a lot of people like what they get with climo because you can absolutely argue that Paul's early titles were just, and it's completely true. The field was nothing like it was, but Paul also just won a world title a few years ago. And that is, I think, very important to the argument. I think that a player being able to kind of like put their stamp on it. Cause imagine if Michael Jordan and LeBron's careers overlapped enough that Michael Jordan could have won. Let's just be really hypothetical an MVP in LeBron's era. That would have changed that argument so drastically. Like it can't even be, you know understated like that that would be huge the biggest like conundrum of the goat argument which from generation to generation is well we'll never know because they weren't playing at the same time they weren't playing at the same competition so i do think that makes it interesting i'm gonna give gary the slight edge today well done gary the brick wall gets the job done there you go jack did you have one more thing to add yeah i do have a rebuttal when it comes to um impact on the game compared to impact on the community so like okay. we look at like like what is Michael Jordan we'll use that NBA example what has Michael Jordan done to impact the community aspect of basketball you know is he gone and has he like yeah I'm going to build and restore all of these outdoor courts in you know inner city Chicago so that all of these people can go play compared to the way he impacted the game playing the game um, and I think that that doesn't take away from what Macbeth has done with the Paul Macbeth foundation and everything. I think that's all phenomenal and really, really good. And that's, is an example of true trying to grow the sport, truly trying to grow the sport. 
But if we're using what the Paul McBeth Foundation has done to call him the GOAT compared to someone else, then I think we're losing sight of he, is he the greatest of all time when it comes to as a disc golfer playing? Would it be all I'd add? Well, I mean, Michael Jordan was a pretty awesome NBA team owner. Am I right? <laughs> uh, Michael Jordan also donated $10 million um, to make a wish foundation and is also the number one requested make a wish person. And he has granted hundreds of make a wishes. You know who's the number one all time You're right, at granting Brody. them and because though? because of that, John because Cena. because of that, Brody, <laughs> Because of that, bro. No, you just asked what he did off the court. I, I was just, I was giving context of what he did off the court. I, Runs I a pretty solid camp too. Off the court that affects his status as the greatest of all time. Listen, guys, I, I, don't, I don't think, I don't think off the court stuff should matter at all. But I was just right. letting you gotta be careful because Brody making, was alive yeah. during the eighties, so we do have to be careful. This is mm. sensitive. I was born in Chicago too. <laughs> that is double true. Double points. And um, I wear Gary. my college jersey under my. Uh, Actual other jerseys. Watch out. Actually? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> it's like, I don't know that's true. Um, Gary, do you have anything to say about your victory today? Uh, good fight. Uh, Jack was nimble. Jack was quick, but looks like Gary goes home with the candlestick. <laughs> uh, <I'm, laughs> no fade. I, I, I appreciate being on here and it's a blast. And uh, I can't wait. Now I'm setting my sights on a rematch with Rich. Coming for you, mm. buddy. Is he like, do I need to start? I need, might need to start putting out like a pound for pound world rankings of the debate night because Rich Ooh, may be, I like, he that. may be like the top dog right now. You should I'll make it, it where you can, like, uh, you can, um, riches. you can, uh, like Gary should be able, next time he's on the show, he should be able to request who he wants to go up against. Oh, just call out, just like, yeah, just call I mean, out. could well, be, just, could be he electric. Just it out there. He wants a rematch, then he wants, Rich. he's gonna get it, he's gonna get it. Um, in the comments below, give me your like rankings, like put down, like who you think are, have been like the best analysts, who you think deserve to be at the top of the rankings. And I don't know, maybe we'll do something. Maybe we'll let you vote on it. I don't know. Um, in any case, if you want to submit a topic for debate night in the future, you can scan this QR code right here on the screen or click the link in the description. I've been getting some good topics, plenty of submissions, get as creative as you'd like with them. We will have disc golf this weekend. So there should be hopefully some dramatic things happen at Jonesboro. And we'll have some very dramatic things to talk about. Other than that, we will see you next week.